Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Serena Longo, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm so pleased to introduce this virtual event with Sarah Fay, presenting her new book, Pathological, joined in conversation by Leslie Jameson. Thank you for joining us virtually this evening. Harvard Bookstore's virtual event series continues this spring, bringing authors and their work to our community and our digital community. Find our event schedule at harvard.com slash events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and shop our shelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll get through as many as time allows. This event also has auto-generated closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom you're using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen, where you can also disable captions. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to pre-order Pathological on harvard.com. It releases next week. Your purchases truly make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you all for tuning in and purchasing books from Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you have no doubt experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And so now I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. Sarah Fay's writing has appeared in many publications, including Long Reads, The New York Times, The Atlantic, Time Magazine, and The Paris Review, where she served as an advisory editor. Her essays have been nominated for Best American Essays and a Pushcart Prize. She is also the recipient of the Hopwood Award for Literature and teaches in the English departments at DePaul University and Northwestern University. Joining her on our digital stage this evening is Leslie Jameson, best-selling author of several titles, including The Recovering and most recently, Make It Scream, Make It Burn. They'll be discussing Sarah's new book, Pathological, the true story of six misdiagnoses. Kirkus Reviews calls it sharply personal and impeccably detailed. And Eliza Griswold writes, in this brilliant and excruciating memoir, through careful reporting and exquisite analysis, Faye takes on the myriad ways in which women's minds, not simply our bodies, have become a marketplace for trendy and dangerous ideas about mental health. This book is a triumph of the spirit and the flesh for a woman who has, since the age of 12, been fighting against all odds, not only to survive, but to live. We're so pleased to be hosting this event tonight. The digital podium is yours, Sarah and Leslie. Thank you, Serena, and thanks yes, thank to Harvard you. Bookstore. It's great to be here. And thank you, Sarah, for coming out to talk about your wonderful, important, provocative new book. Um, and I was hoping maybe you would start off by reading a little bit for us, and then we can talk about it and talk about it with everybody who's gathered. Great. I would love to. And I just want to thank you so much. Those of you, if anyone here hasn't read Leslie, start, wait until after the reading and to the conversation, but then buy all of her books. She's amazing. And I'm just so happy to be here. And thank you, Harvard Bookstore and Serena so much. So I'm going to read from a, a passage just, or little two sections later in the book. A um, couple things you may need to know at this point, I'm in my mid forties and I've been living with my mother. I was no longer able to live independently as a result of really suffering from serious mental illness at that point. Um, I was on my sixth diagnosis. Um, I had first been diagnosed at 12. And by now I've just received, or you know, this is the second time I've heard that I have bipolar disorder. Um, yeah, I think that's all you need to know. After Googling for some time, I found a bipolar specialist. It seemed too good to be true, an expert in my particular illness, my diagnosis, my bipolar. Dr. M would be all to me, psychiatrist and therapist. The waiting room of his office offered filter water and a little Dixie cups. On the phone, he'd said we'd meet to determine if we were the right fit. I'd already talked myself into believing that he, the bipolar expert, would help me make sense of my life, my thoughts, my diagnosis, my mind, once and for all. 
The door opened. A blonde, bright but serious man poked his head out and called me in. He wore a comfy looking cardigan sweater. His blonde hair was stiff and well coiffed. He was young but gave off an air of quiet confidence. I stood and followed him down a hallway of closed office doors, behind which were other psychiatrists in his practice. His office was windowless and small. I sat on the gray couch, fake leather and overly cushioned. He sat on a desk chair close by. On his desk behind him was a can of grapefruit LaCroix. It read, naturally essenced sparkling water. Essenced seemed to come from a place where water sparkled and nothing ever went wrong. For 40 minutes, he asked me about my mental health history and a bit about my life. I told him about the other diagnoses and the hospital in Iowa and the image of me in the bathtub in Chicago, all of it. When we finished, I asked if I was bipolar. He was the expert, he would know. Turning to his desk, he picked up the LaCroix can. I wondered if he'd mind that it was warm. He faced me again, can in hand. Yes, I was bipolar, bipolar too. He slipped his finger under the tab and opened the can. When the scent of grapefruit reached me, it tasted of relief. That night, I filled out the life chart Dr. M had assigned me. Seated at the desk in my mother's study, I colored in the graph provided, blocking out years and writing in events, shading the highs and lows that could be considered bipolar episodes. It had the look of real data, bars jutting above the zero axis, the normal axis, and others falling below it. Months when the black mass or sodden pit in my stomach was there and my mind slowed. Days and weeks when the splintering and cracking happened and I'd felt an urgent need to run or walk or dance to music only I could hear. The grandiose plans I'd had to finish my dissertation in three months, which I did, and still had to finish a novel in about the same time, which I didn't. My life was no longer divided into weeks and months and years. It was made up of manic and depressive episodes. I leaned back in my chair and stared down at the chart. 20 years of hypomanic highs and depressive lows. 20 years of undiagnosed bipolar disorder. I put down my pen. My sessions with Dr. M revolved around my illness. His questions reframed events and interactions in terms of my bipolar. My past became reordered. Memories played at a slower or faster speed. The motivations behind this or that decision were different now that I saw them through the lens of bipolarity. His presence, just his presence, promised I'd never be suicidal again. The time between our sessions was interminable. Always there loomed the thread, threat of another episode, depressive or manic, worse than the one before. Only he had the answer. With him, I managed my new life as someone with bipolar. Managed was a word I heard a lot. Manage meaning handle. Manage meaning cope. I learned more about bipolar disorder than any lay person should know. The internet offered so much information, so much contradictory information about the natural remedies I could add. Folic acid and vitamin B12 were crucial to sound mental health. No, magnesium was. A high fat, low carb diet caused depression. No, a low fat, high carb diet did. Green and black teas were high in the amino acid L-theanine, which relieved stress and anxiety, but caffeine triggered manic episodes. The Mediterranean diet was the key to relieving depression, but particularly in smokers. Blogs on the Harvard Health website reported that there was, quote, an overwhelming evidence for a connection between food and mental health, though others insisted further studies were urgently required to elucidate whether a quote, true causal association exists. I scrolled down the Medical News Today website, passed an ad for Vralar, an antipsychotic as yet unknown to me, to be told once again that bipolar might be caused by a chemical imbalance that may or may not be helped by fish oil and vitamin C. Website after website confirmed that my prognosis was grave. With the diagnosis, my life expectancy had shortened by nine to 20 years. The illness would worsen over time, each manic or depressive occurrence increasing that likelihood. With each depressive episode, my risk of having dementia rose. There was a very good chance I'd never have a long-term relationship or hold a regular job. I'd relapse, I'd end my own life. 
the inevitable was coming. Early death, more frequent episodes, relapses, suicide. I admitted to myself that I was, in fact, living, not staying with my mother. I registered with a, with a disability at one of the universities where I worked. My diet was impeccable, my sleep regular when I wasn't in an episode, and my schedule precise. I rarely went out at night or during the day except to teach, walk, and run. I wrote my novel, I read, I watched Netflix, I prepped classes, I taught. I lost count of the number of times Dr. M told me how ill I was. The premise of our work together was that I was very, very sick. Occasionally he agreed with first person consideration that I was someone with a mental illness, not mentally ill. I was, as the cliche goes, more than my illness. It's not as if I could have questioned my diagnosis. Not admitting I was bipolar indicated a lack of insight, anisognosia, which meant I was in denial, which meant I was sicker than I thought. Thank you. Thanks so much. It was, um, it's really wonderful. It always feels like something kind of uh, moving from two dimensions to three or three dimensions to the fourth dimension to, to uh, hear it in your voice and, and just really beautiful to feel it come alive. And I have so many questions to ask, although I actually now have another question that I'm gonna lead with just that kind of rises from just hearing your, your prose and um, is, a, is a question about craft. Um, but I also wanna just put out there for everybody who's here, go ahead and start putting your questions in the Q&A whenever you have them and whenever they arise. Sometimes with events like this, as in real life, there can be a sort of people are shy about the questions to begin with. And then there's like the flood, you know, at the at the end. So anyway, just, just put them there and we'll turn there in a little bit. But I mean, so the place that I'm gonna start and then maybe I'll peel back to some more big picture questions about, about the scope of this um, really, really ambitious and singular book is, is around, I was struck by that line in the, um, uh, Kirkus review that that called this like a sharply detailed memoir that was really um, spoke to an important part of my experience reading it. It feels so populated and electric and granular with so much specificity. And anybody who's ever heard me talk about writing, it's like my primary god is specificity, right? It's like where the truth lives. And um, listening to that passage you read aloud, I was so struck by just the feeling of the cushions in the office, the the snapping back of the can of LaCroix, the scent of grapefruit reaching you like relief. And um, I wonder how you think about in, in telling stories and telling stories about your life, how do you think about the role of detail? How do you, ch how do you choose which of those details are gonna, um, are gonna be included in the story? What, what kinds of work do you imagine details doing? Um, what, 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 what's the, what are the kind of deep goals of, of writing so lushly for you? It's interesting because I feel like I'm not very good at that. <laughs> I actually feel like that's one of my weaknesses. So maybe what I do is I, I concentrate there and I really rely on that very heavily because I'd always been told that getting an MFA you know, as I'm sure others can relate to, that that was my weakness. So suddenly, you know, that weakness maybe has become my strength because I paid so much attention to it. Mm -hmm. But I think also I was really conscious of not being believed mm -hmm. and not that, well, one, I was questioning diagnoses, you know, mental health diagnoses that we rely on, that we in some ways don't question, partly because we don't know to question them like I did and partly because we don't want to, because we just don't want to go there or because we don't, you know, we just don't. And I did really, I was very conscious of how am I going to make this as real as possible and account for everything that I'm saying. And when we were selling the book, one of the editors asked me, what did you rely on? Did you have, do you have journals with this in? And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to <laughs> document everything <laughs> that I've written. But it was a great question because she was basically asking, where are these memories coming from? And how do you have, how did you validate these memories? And that became an obsession with me in the book, which is why I have so many citations. So I have over 500 citations from peer-reviewed journals and academic publishers primarily 
because I knew I was saying things that I couldn't say, you know, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a mental health professional. And I wanted to back those up. And also, I guess, with detail and, and just setting scenes and inviting people in, I wanted to weave those strands so that we had the research and the information, but also the narrative. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really um, interesting point about veracity and immersion and how yeah, the impulse to sort of fully render the scenes of these stories maybe is related to that, um, that constant imperative to have to tell your story in a way that proves it's, it's truth or something like that. Like that kind of the, the various skeptical audiences that I imagine your story has been met with in all kinds of contexts. And, and I was also thinking there's something so, um, you know, so embodied about so many of the details. And it, it also strikes me in, in thinking about the ways in which you're um, questioning diagnoses that par part of where you're often locating certain emotional experiences is in the body, right? That almost like in, in close attention to the ways in which emotion or interior lives live in the body becomes almost a, a, an alternative framework to the kind of diagnostic fictions of, of that you're pushing back against. But anyway, I have some more questions about kind of like embodiment and some of these more embodied descriptions of emotions. But I was thinking, you know, just listening to you read, I was thinking, oh, right, it makes sense that sensory detail would have a really important role to play in a story about emotion that is kind of interested in maybe some of these more corporeal ways of understanding the things that have been understood in terms of abstractions. Um, but I mean, I think that that brings me to one of the questions about kind of the overarching ambitions of this book. And very early on, you say, you know, this is not a, this is a book that resists the traditional mental illness memoir. And I just love, you know, as a way maybe of introducing the book to those who don't know it as well. Uh, I'm sure some people are already familiar with, with it who are here and others maybe not if you could just kind of explain a little bit what that means to you to have written a book that resists the, the traditional mental illness memoir, both in terms of content and then maybe also if it's relevant in terms of the craft and structure of the book itself. So it's about having received six different um, mental health diagnoses starting when I was 12. I received a diagnosis of anorexia when I was 12. In my 20s, I was told that I had major depressive disorder then generalized anxiety disorder. Then in my 30s, I was told I had actually obsessive compulsive disorder. Then it was attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And then it was those all in combination. So I was told actually I had attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and OCD plus depressive and anxious features. And then finally, I was given a diagnosis of bipolar two and then bipolar one. So it is that trajectory from the age of 12 until I was about 45, 46 um, or so. And I still have a, you know, I believe in mental illness 100%, even though in the book, I really question and call to task the diagnoses that were given and question, how could I have be given, been given six different diagnoses over the course of my life? How could one be traded for the other so easily? Why? were these so exchangeable? I didn't, I couldn't, after, at first I believed in them wholeheartedly and then I started to question them once I just started getting worse and worse. But that's all to say that um, the book really does embrace and believe that mental illness is very, very real. It's just questioning the diagnoses that were given. Um, so I do that. So there are basically three threads in the book. And one is my narrative, my story of those six diagnoses. And then one is, I really went in and did just an immense amount of research. And I, it was really that research pulled me out of a serious suicidal um, series of episodes that I was going through. And really when I was at my worst, I went to see a new psychiatrist. My sister found me that psychiatrist after Dr. M. Dr. M and I ended up having a falling out and I went to see a new psychiatrist. I was out of medication. Dr. M wouldn't refill my medications. I had no psychiatrist. My sister came to the rescue. She's really one of the heroes in this book. My whole family, they're the heroes for sure. Um, but so I went to see a new psychiatrist 
And we had the initial you know, consultation session. And after 27 minutes, I waited for him to proclaim a new diagnosis or re you know, reify my old diagnosis of bipolar. And he looked at me and he said, I don't know what you have. And so that just changed everything for me. And that's when I started to research the DSM and I started wondering like, does anyone know what I have? Does anyone know what any of us have? What are we, what are these diagnoses and where do they come from? So that's the second thread. And then the third thread is punctuation. <laughs> so it's, a, it's, a, it, it's kind of a, where my mind traveled as I was writing the book. And I am obsessed with punctuation. I always, I have been since I almost failed my 10th grade term paper. I tell my students <laughs> that you, you can almost fail your 10th grade term paper and go on to write for the New York Times. It is possible, you can do that. But my English teacher at the time said that I used commas like I was decorating a Christmas tree. So I just kind of arbitrarily put them in, which I did 100%. So that was, and it was funny because I had been in conversation with a couple of agents and they were really trying to talk me out of cutting the punctuation. And the agent I ended up going with, Kim Witherspoon, who I cannot be more grateful to because she believed in me and believed in this book 100%. But she said something that, which was the purpose of the punctuation. She said, it's so, it's an intense book and the punctuation sections where I just investigate what punctuation is and the sort of the history of different punctuation marks that correspond to each chapter. She said, it's like a breather. You have a chance to kind of take a breath and then go back to it. So, yeah. And oh, I'm so glad um, it's as if you're like reading my notes because punctuation, all of my like very enthusiastic scribbles about the punctuation thread of this book are, are right there <laughs> next. Um, so I'm so glad you, you brought it up as one of those threads. And one of the first things you say about punctuation um, is that, you know, in ancient Greek uh, texts, there was like no, you know, that it was just all letters. I mean, I learned so much from this book and I'm so grateful for it, but that idea of all just no, the words weren't separated by anything. It was just a sort of exhalation monolith of text. And so in a way, Kim's observation about what the punctuation sections are doing in this book is somewhat similar to what punctuation itself did for these like massive blocks of just intense, undifferentiated words. You know, it sort of gives these, gives some spaces and some breathing room and just not only the delight of learning as much as we do about punctuation, but also the delight of encountering you as a curious mind, you know, you, you mentioned Dr. M, um, you know, kind of acknowledging, although maybe the very premise of your work together was, was not fully acknowledging it, but, but acknowledging at least explicitly, like you're more than a diagnosis, right? But there's a way in which we get to see you in a totally different mode in relation to the punctuation. You know, you're like an investigator and a gatherer of knowledge and an enthusiast and somebody experiencing kind of deep intellectual joy in engaging with the punctuation. And those offer sort of different tonalities than, you know, the other parts of you that are exquisitely present on the page as well that are, you know, suffering deeply and sort of almost like shaping your life narrative around the diagnoses that are being offered to you. Um, but I wanted to ask a little bit more about, you know, beyond that kind of experiential function of, of the punctuation sections is offering a bit of relief. Um, why did that punctuation strand feel so necessary to you? Like, what can you illuminate? What do you illuminate through these investigations of punctuation that you felt you couldn't get at or couldn't get at as effectively otherwise? I, I really wanted, I was so ignorant of DSM diagnoses and where our mental health diagnoses come from. I was, that whole time that I was going through it, I had no idea. I just assumed that people in lab coats with Petri dishes and microscopes came up with bipolar disorder. You know, I just thought it was this was thoroughly scientific, you know, all these diagnoses were scientific. And I knew nothing about them. And I knew nothing about punctuation. I was a writer. I was a, I was a writing tutor <laughs> and I did not know my stuff. I mean, I, I really wanna get a hold of all the students I may have led astray over those years because I, I wanted to know everything, but punctuation and, and the English language is difficult. And when I taught English as a second language in a, you know, in a women's center in Brooklyn, in the basement of a women's center, 
English is a second language. I mean, one thing I admired so much and it took me a while to figure out is English rules are constantly changing. It's the most maddening language for people to try to learn. And that goes for native speakers. You know, why are we now spelling email without a hyphen? Why are we now, you know, why are, why are so many of the rules changing the Oxford comma, whatever it might be. And so then it just became a passion of mine, but I wanted those two parallels in the book because I think a lot of people don't know punctuation. I know that because now everyone I correspond with <laughs> is afraid to write to me and make a punctuation error. But the, we also don't know a lot about the diagnoses we're receiving and the diagnoses our children are receiving and young people. And so I wanted that. It's my own you know, kind of journey through both and learning about both. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that idea of, of, of multiple journeys and... Um... And yeah, I mean, there's just so much really incredible history and information about punctuation. Like I was so, um, I was so fascinated by the idea of like parentheses, for example, as this, as, um, as a vessel for interiority, the sort of secret, the secret in the parentheses or the fact that they used to be called um, little, little moons, um, which is so beautiful. And, and then there are some really powerful intersections between the mental health threads and the, punct the punctuation threads. I mean, one that's coming to mind is um, Project Semicolon, which maybe you could explain a little bit about and, and how that connects to your engagement with the, with the semicolon. And that was interesting. So the semicolon, Project Semicolon was started, um, basically it took up the semicolon as a symbol rather than just the punctuation mark. Um, as a way to really encourage people to pause before ending their lives or if considering suicide. And it had this huge uh, sort of undertaking or it was swept up in, on social media and people really embraced it and people were getting tattoos of semicolons and, and taking pictures of them and posting them on social media. And that I had never heard of actually until I was writing the book. And so, for instance, the semicolon comes in the chapter that really, when I was at my most suicidal. So I tried to pair the um, punctuation marks with whatever was happening for me at that during in that chapter. And the one that went that was most relevant in the sense of, I mean, they're all relevant, but they weren't just narratively relevant. Was the backslash. So when attention deficit hyperactivity disorder became ADHD slash ADD, when they dropped hyperactivity from the diagnosis, it made it wildly easier to diagnose. So suddenly at first you had to have hyperactivity. That was the cornerstone of an ADHD diagnosis. And once they dropped that and said, okay, you know, actually you don't have to have that. Suddenly it really opened up many more people to be diagnosed and, and some people like Alan Francis, who's one of the architects of the DSM has said that that led to an epidemic, a false epidemic of meaning a lot of people were diagnosed or a lot of young people and children that may not have, or may, may not have been really worthy of that diagnosis or deserved that diagnosis, I guess, not deserved in a, but you know, should have been given that diagnosis. Yeah, and certainly kind of overdiagnosis or the the low the low bar or low threshold is one of the primary veins of skepticism around diagnoses here. Um, and and that, that's a sort of useful case study for that lowered threshold as well. I have another question that really directly follows on what you just said, um, but I'll also just um, encourage, I already see some questions in the Q&A and I would just encourage um, anybody who has them to go ahead and put them in probably in about 10 or 15 minutes we'll we'll turn to incorporating some of those questions from the audience into our conversation I promise we will not judge how they are <laughs> punctuated so <laughs> not my there. Um, I won't even look <laughs> I love that image by the way of of using commas um, like you were decorating a Christmas tree. It makes me want to use comments like that. I mean, it makes, <laughs> were, were we all to have such a kind of aesthetic relationship to the comma? Um, I mean, you know, since you were, you know, uh, kind of bringing up that, the, the lowered threshold for that particular diagnosis and the kind of false epidemic, I mean, I wonder if you could, in some ways, this is the core question of the book, so feel free to answer in whatever direction you like, but I mean, what to you are the 
um, potential uses of a diagnosis and the potential perils of a diagnosis. Like what, what are the, what are the dangers in this diagnostic system that, that is so embraced? I think the, the re, I, I get, like I say in, in my, the introduction, um, and I should answer your, go back to answering your question as to why this is not a typical mental illness memoir, but in the introduction, I talk about that, you know, I'm not angry at psychiatry, actually. I'm not anti-psychiatry. So often mental illness memoirs, or we could even say that people who are against uh, the sort of overdiagnosis and misdiagnosis and the kind of prevalence of diagnoses in our culture, mental health diagnoses, because they're all over the place. They're on social media and young people self-diagnose and TikTok therapists diagnose people. And so it's very much a part of our culture. Um, but that, that basically the, that we would essentially diagnoses are, and I think I'm going a little bit off track here, but diagnoses are good in some ways and bad in others, but typically in a mental illness memoir, the person who has the mental illness or the narrator accepts whatever diagnosis the person's has. That's the whole point is that they come to some realization. Rarely do they find out it was actually a physical illness or something along those lines. And so what I'm doing is actually questioning the diagnoses in general. But going back to where they're good and where they're, where they're bad, I actually think they're dangerous in that we don't know where they come from and we don't know that they aren't scientifically valid. And what that means is there's no biological marker. So when Dr. M gave me a diagnosis of bipolar, I, I can't argue with him and I can't necessarily say, no, I don't. Let's take that blood test. Let's get that x-ray. Um, so there's no way for us to tell that one, that they exist objectively um, or that the person who's been given the diagnosis actually has it. So we, it, they're really, all diagnoses rely on self-reported symptoms and the opinion of, of a clinician based on what they see in the DSM and, and what they interpret from it. So for me, the, you know, and diagnoses are also highly unreliable, meaning you can go to one uh, clinician and you'll get one diagnosis and go to another and you'll likely get another diagnosis. But none of that in itself is bad. Although, as I was saying, I say in the introduction that I'm only angry at the DSM, not psychiatry necessarily. And that's also because my diagnoses were given to me for the most part by primary care physicians, not psychiatrists. I didn't see a psychiatrist until I was in my forties. So, but that the, that basically there's nothing wrong with any of this if we knew the truth. And if the person giving the diagnosis were to say, you may have bipolar disorder, there's no way to prove bipolar disorder exists. Here's a medication you may become reliant on and not be able to go off for the rest of your life. And do you, you know, do you accept this? Should we go forward with the treatment? I may have said yes to all of that. It sounds absurd and I'm sort of grimacing, but I really would have probably, I may have done everything the same as I did if people had just been honest with me, but I would have known the truth, which is that this is a really unreliable, invalid diagnosis, but there's something wrong. So let's play with this one and see how it goes kind of a thing. But they were proclaimed from on high to me and I just became them. So that's what I see as being um, dangerous with them. But there are many you know, groups and communities that are very much empowered by their diagnoses. And the autism community really stands out to me. And that is a diagnosis that they rally around and they take great pride in and they feel very empowered by. So to me, there's nothing, you know, again, I'm not discouraging anyone from identifying with a diagnosis. I'm more asking the mental health professionals and clinicians full transparency about the diagnoses that they're given. Yeah. And that struck me as well. Like even the, you know, kind of closing lines of your epilogue are not advocating resistance to diagnosis or, or categorically or universally, but just um, making a case for the value of a fuller understanding of yeah, where diagnoses come from, what it is that they're based on. Um, and the fact that there is a kind of, as your own story is an illumination of it, uh, you know, there's not a, there's, there's nothing like an objective metric that would guarantee that, you know, six different clinicians would give you the six same diagnosis as, as didn't happen for you. And, you know, when you were saying that thing about your, 
um, sort of the psychiatrist who finally said, rather than simply applying the same diagnosis or yet another diagnosis said, you know, I don't, I don't know. I was so struck by like, um, I had a conversation once with a, ch a child, a five-year-old who was having a, a, a really major meltdown. And I asked her, you know, um, what, what's wrong? Like, what's wrong? And she said, I remember she said, well, it could be this thing Tommy said to me on Wednesday, but if it's not that, I don't know what it is. And I was so struck by the kind of wisdom and self-knowledge of just being able to say, I don't know actually where this is coming from, how that felt in a way more, more generative and, and sophisticated than simply doing the thing that I think our minds are so programmed to do, which is reach for an explanation, any explanation and try to slap it on because it's uncomfortable to live in a state of unknowing or it's uncomfortable to live without the category or the label. And your book is asking us to spend more time, I think, in that particular zone of discomfort without the relief of kind of reaching at least immediately or, or unthinkingly for the categorical description, the diagnostic description. Um, I'm curious how, um, how, what the kind of process of writing the book was like around revision um, and surprise. And I think surprise is, is one of the elements of, of writing that is most compelling to me and, and most interesting to, to talk about. So I'm curious, I guess it's a two-part question. I'm curious what surprised you in the process of writing the book or revising the book, what you kind of didn't know before you wrote it, I guess, and what you didn't know about even maybe what you wanted to say before you started saying it. Um, and I'm also, the second part of the question is, I'm curious, you know, how many drafts this book went through and kind of what what changed across the course of those drafts? What did you have to lean into? How how and where did you change direction? What it what yeah, what what came first and what came six drafts later? Um <laughs> Well, it's, I, I'm just, I'm kind of hooked on, you may have to repeat a couple of those because I'm so hooked on, you have in the acknowledgments in the recovering, great book, by the way, everybody. So, but um, in the recovering, you, you quote Charlie D'Ambrosio telling you that the problem with an essay can turn out to be its subject, mm -hmm. that whatever you're struggling with, and I, I, I wrote it down, <laughs> so, you know, that was, and it's one that I've now stuck with a lot, but I wrote it very, very quickly. I wrote this book very quickly. And I, I was, I'm actually hesitant to say that because there's a story of F. Scott Fitzgerald that he wrote, I think Tender in the, is the Night very quickly. And he told a lot of people and then reviewers <laughs> came out and said, it seems like he wrote this very quickly. And then just like wrote everything that was wrong with it. So I'm tempted not to say that, but I had spent five years writing this novel that just went nowhere. And then, I don't know that I, I don't remember ever actually deciding to write this. I wrote an essay for long reads um, about brackets and solitude, which is actually chapter 13 in the book, uh, a, a slightly changed version of it. And that just started me on it. And I started going with punctuation marks actually was how I would start each chapter. So it has 14 chapters. There are 14 punctuation marks. And so that was the structure. And once I had that, I pretty much just went, you know, I just moved very quickly through it. Um, I had interest from an agent who, it was set up as essays at first. And really the, the feedback I got was we can't sell this. You know, well, <laughs> essays don't sell. Ha ha, look at Leslie Jameson. <laughs> they don't know Leslie Jameson, obviously no, they did, but <laughs> for most humans, earthly creatures. But uh, so then I knew, okay, it has to be a memoir. I have to really be looking at the overall arc more so. And I didn't like that. I was extremely uncomfortable with it. I just thought, I don't want to dram dramatize my life. I just wanted to kind of, get at ideas in essay form. I didn't really want to write this story. And circling back a little bit to what you were saying about how bodily it is and the details in the book and the descriptions and the richness of it, part of that is my experience of mental illness was that it was so isolating. I was so isolated for 30 years, not just, I'm, I'm a rather solitary person anyway, but that it is just, 
it's extremely isolating. And I do think a lot of people who've been through serious mental illness would, would agree that there's something that just shuts out. So everything is very loud and everything is very sensitive and everything feels very, you know, you're, you're very sensitive to everything or you're numb to a lot. Um, so uh, anyway, that was something I had to move into. That was what I had to lean into. And then, as I said, I just found the most amazing agent. She asked for no revisions and we went to shop it pretty much right away. We sold it in the middle of the pandemic. I didn't think that was possible. <laughs> like Fresh, new pandemic, early pandemic. And so then I luckily got the best, most perfect editor for this book. And she was one of those, I just didn't know what to make of her at first because she kind of wasn't there a lot. And I just thought, what are we doing? And, you know, should I be revising? When do we, when do we go with this? And she just swooped in, gave me three points. And she said, these three things are what the book needs. And they were exactly what the book needed. And what it was, she, she was just amazing. Um, the main one was I, I wasn't focused on the DSM at first. I wasn't focused only on diagnoses. And that really brought the book together. That was what just kind of, and then her other two points, I, I can't actually remember specifically what they were. They were fairly minor, but that one really just made it gel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, and it's, um, it's really, it's interesting to hear about that kind of initial conception that it really began in a way with the, the organizing principle and lens of the punctuation as, as this way into those stories. Um, because I think reading it, you might almost think that, that it had been the opposite of the DSM or, you, you know, to know that that had come in later. Um, and it made me think as you were talking about an initial feeling of resistance to writing as fully into the personal narrative as a kind of narrative spine connecting these, these various installments and the various diagnoses. Um, I'm curious, once you sort of um, decided to go for it in the sense of writing the personal and writing the personal as that narrative spine, how did you, how did you sort of figure out how to tackle the infinitude of the personal? I mean, that's one of the things that I think about. It's like sometimes personal experience feels simultaneously like not enough and too much. You know, it's like there's, there's, it, it's, it's almost like there can simultaneously be that anxiety of like, why would anybody care about this thing that I have lived? And also there's so much that I've lived and how do I only tell this partial necessarily incomplete and partial version of what I've lived. And I'm curious how you sort of navigated that infinitude. How did you figure out what was essential, even on the level of like, you know, the squash soup your partner is making for you in the apartment or the grapefruit liqueur or sort of how, how did you figure out what ultimately felt to you like this is, the, these are the parts of the personal that I need to tell in order to get at these questions that are so compelling. Part of it, I think is that I don't have the best memory in the sense of I don't had, I didn't, that time was so chaotic and mental illness is so chaotic that really the, the times that were so vivid and stuck out to me, I knew were the right moments to write. It just seemed fairly obvious. Um, but then there were, I mean, there were a couple of chapters that got cut. So we did move, there was one on the space and that was removed in the revision process. So I think that the, it's funny, but I'm writing the next book now. So I'm writing the sequel, <laughs> so, um, which I never intended to write, but I really don't believe that mental illness is chronic. And I believe that I have fully healed and that I have recovered. And I want to start the, what I hope will become the well-worn genre of the mental illness recovery novel or <laughs> memoir, <laughs> you know, that subgenre, um, which there really isn't, you know, people don't write that story. Um, and I've been looking for it. And, but I've been looking at what did I leave out of pathological and why did I leave it out? Mm -hmm. And one thing I left out was the two primary relationships, romantic relationships that are in there, I didn't include anyone else that may have come in or out of my life, even if they may have been relevant in some way. And I think that's just because I so respect my family and I respect the people who loved me and cared for me during that time that I just wanted to 
really honor them and to sort of give them their due, the ones who were really there for me. And, and so that became a motivation as to what to keep in as well and what to focus on. Mm -hmm. That's a really compelling and kind of beautiful answer and um, makes me think about the moment in the book when you um, point out that the etymology of the word cure is connected to caregiving and, and you're sort of thinking about you think and write so beautifully in this book about various forms of caregiving that you've received. And even you can hear it in the way that you talk about the book, how, how, um, how who you feel the heroes of the book are and, and, and that, that way that you're, you, you, you just, um, you do justice in really compelling ways to, to the ways that people, um, cared for you and, and what that care looked like, not just in, in big sweeping strokes, but in very particular daily strokes. And I, I was really compelled by that. And I'm going to ask one last follow-up about what you just dangled is the, the sequel that you're working on now. And then I'll turn um, to some wonderful questions that we already have. And I imagine there will be a few more. Um, I'm, I, would, I would love if you would be willing to say a few more words about what you're working on now in, in uh, the reco recovery memoir is a genre close to my heart, but I agree this is a very different um, different creature that you're describing. So uh, yeah. I love, so I just, I reread The Recovering, which is uh, Leslie's beautiful book about not just her recovery memoir, but also questioning and, and highlighting the recovery memoir genre. And it's just fantastic. And I reread it this weekend and it's so addicting. Sorry for the pun, but <laughs> every time I think of it, that's what I think of is how addicting it is. But um, so one reason I was reading it was because of this, of the book I'm writing now. And so what it is, is, is it's going to pick up where pathological leaves off. When I finished pathological, I was really, I don't, I didn't want to give simplistic answers to people about, okay, let's be a little skeptical about the diagnoses we're given and that our children are given. And I don't have any answers. So the, the mental illness memoir, like the classic one often gives this elixir of this is all you have to do, or this is all you have to do. And, and what I say is, you know, I think all we have to do is just know the truth and, and to be more, you know, demand transparency from our you know, mental health professionals and also clinicians. But so it picks up from that moment. And since then, I have just been so grateful and so amazed by my recovery. And what I didn't know was that the depths of pathological were was really the start of my recovery. And I was very hesitant to say that to anyone. I think I spoke with my family a little bit about it in hushed tones, because you're not supposed to heal from mental illness. You're not supposed to, it's, it's lifelong and you have to continue on. And it is a very complicated situation. So I want to be clear about that. I still take medication. I still see a psychiatrist. I live a very structured life. I don't drink, I don't do drugs. So it's not like I'm free, I'm cured. <laughs> Let's have a party. You know, that's never, that's not how it's going to be for me, but the, but there's no question that my my whole life, my whole existence, my emotional framework, my mental framework is just, I, I'm healed. And so I was very hesitant to say that. And then Thomas Insel, who is the former director of the National Institute for Mental Health, just came out with a beautiful book called Healing mm -hmm. um, Our Path from Mental Illness to Mental Health. And in it, he says, mental illness is not chronic. We can heal. And that felt like, oh my gosh, I just got permission to heal. <laughs> and so now, and I got to interview him and, and met him and he's a lovely man and, and someone I respect greatly. And one thing he talks about though, is you need three Ps to heal. And one is people, place, and purpose. And I am one of the very few people who had all three. And I had my family who was just unbelievable through the whole thing for me. And I, my mother gave me part of her home for me to really be very ill in and, and to start to heal in. And I also had my writing and I had my teaching and those things are so important to me. So I had all three Ps. And I think now what my interest in is, all right, what, who doesn't, you know, there are so many people who don't and how are we going to bring that to them and how can we educate all people? So I'm hoping this book will do that as well. And then it's also a history of emotions. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm excited about that. So the sort of the history of the DSM and diagnosis, it's the history of emotions because I've really had to learn what emotions are. I, I didn't know what they were and I didn't know how to process them. So that's what it is. Well, I am excited. <laughs> Find me up for a history of emotions and then exploration of healing any day. Um, love that. Um, well, I'm going to turn, I have lots more questions in my quiver, but I'm going to turn to some of the questions that we have from some of the folks who are here um, because they're thoughtful and, and I'm sure you'll have thoughtful things to say about them. Um, uh, Rachel notes, I am a psychologist and I'm uncomfortable with the term mental illness because it seems so blaming as well as um, permanent. And she asks, what is your relationship to diagnosis now, if any? That's such a great point. Um, I like the term mental illness and I'm very proud of it. And I, I wear it very proudly. And I think that, and I, I completely understand what you're saying. I think you're right that it does have a, it rings of chronicity, you know, it rings of you're going to have this for the rest of your life. But now that people like Thomas Insel and others are talking about that and, and really using that term mental illness is not chronic, that if we can get that out there, but mental illness to me is really, you know, and I experienced it um, was a level of dysfunction. You know, it wasn't just not being satisfied with my life or the quality of my life, not being where I wanted it to. It was serious dysfunction. Um, and I am so, I have so much admiration for people who have suffered mental illness, who have survived mental illness, who continue to uh, engage with mental illness. And I really feel like we're a very strong group. We don't get a lot of credit, but I think that that could become a term of real um, strength and empowerment, actually, because people who have been through anything like what I went through and much, much worse or even less, uh, you have to be very strong to go through that. And I think we are not giving people the credit that they deserve, but I have a diagnosis. I do not know what it is. My psychiatrist has changed it three times. I don't want to know what it is. I just saw him about a month ago. <laughs> I tell him, don't tell me. <laughs> so there's a diagnosis on paper. I don't know what it is. I mean, diagnoses have their place. We need them. Mental health professionals need them to get reimbursed by insurance companies. We need them for educational services. We need them to file for disability. They're useful in some cases in legal situations. So that the, they're there and I don't want to get rid of them. It's more just so that we know what we're dealing with. And um, it wasn't helpful for me to identify with a, ment with a um, mental health diagnosis, a DSM diagnosis, because I became them. I became, once I had major depression, I became a more depressed person. Mm -hmm. So it just wasn't helpful. And this question is actually really connected to that last observation and to what you said in the portion you read aloud about starting to view your life events through the lens of bipolar. Um, this question says, you talked a little bit in the excerpt you read earlier about how looking at your life through the bipolar lens changed how you viewed events. Did you feel that way about the process of writing the book? Were there any events that you started viewing differently in the process of writing? Hmm. I don't think so because I was so focused on accounting for what happened, it felt much more investigative and rather than interpretive. And so, yeah, I don't think I, I did reframe in that same way. I'm curious if writing this new book, I will, mm -hmm. and how I'll see things differently. And I really want the new book to be a conversation with pathological because it will be interesting to see how pathological reads as I'm, you know, as someone who's recovered and, you know, even, you know, we don't, it's so exciting to be able to say that and to, to tell people that they can actually recover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great to hear you say that. And well, I'll, I'll give you this last question um, because it's partially about relief and, I, and I'm interested in and how and where you can connect the ideas of recovery and relief. Um, but it's, we'll, we'll, we'll take this last question and then close out. Um, as someone who has spent years of my life wondering what's wrong with me, both physically and mentally, and being frustrated by doctors and therapists who are unable to put their finger on just what the problem is, your perspective here is really fascinating. Did you have moments of relief following any of your diagnoses? And if so, how did that relief eventually evolve into skepticism and seeking freedom slash recovery? Absolutely. Every diagnosis was like a, um, you know, a, a 
really sweet dessert, you know, it felt like so good at first and then it didn't last and it wasn't nourishing in any way. So they were very delicious at first because it felt like, yes, I've got the answer. And then it wouldn't, it, it's, I mean, some of them I, you know, believed I had for almost a decade. So that it's not as if they didn't last, but that first little bit of satisfaction faded and they became less useful for me. And so relief is something. And, and then the other part of this was, this was not an easy process to go through. And that's why I'm excited to write about it because taking away my diagnosis was not something I wanted. And if someone had tried to do this to me 10 years ago, I would have probably like wrestled them to the ground. You know, I want, I needed my diagnosis. My diagnosis was very much a part of me. So to live without it is very scary. I mean, there is a lot of, I understand that. I understand why it, it, it's a kind of grounding mechanism in some ways for a lot of people. And I respect that completely. It's just that for me, it was limiting and it was to the point that it was actually becoming dangerous for me to keep believing what people were telling me. And again, I think that's because I was recovering and, and I just, if I hadn't, it I could have very easily not allowed myself to recover, but I was willing to kind of take that chance and say, well, okay, what, what is it like not to attribute all of my thoughts, emotions, and behaviors to a diagnosis? What if I just let sadness come over me? What if I just let this paralyzing anxiety be paralyzing anxiety? I don't have to change my medication. I don't have to get another appointment. Like I could just let it be. And it doesn't mean anything's getting worse and it doesn't mean anything's, you know, just what it is. And I'm, I'm still really working on that, which is why I'm loving reading about emotions and what they are. I didn't even know emotions were vibrations in your body. I, had, I, didn't, I would never have been able to tell you what an emotion was except a word, you know, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so much to say about all of that. We'll have to reconvene in <laughs> five years so that I can, or, or three, I don't know. It seems like you write quickly, but uh, so I can ask you some questions about, emotion and um, I can't wait for the I can't wait for this next book and it's such a pleasure such a pleasure to get to talk to you about this one uh Sarah so um thank you thank so you so so much it was such an honor yeah yeah hi thank you both so much that was really just very powerful and uh also just very informative. I didn't know that emotions were vibrations in your body either until this moment. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, and yes, thank you both for being here. And thanks to all of you out there for spending your evening with us. Um, please mm -hmm. take a moment to pre-order Pathological um, on harvard.com. I'm just posting the link in the chat again. Um, and yeah, hope to see you both for your upcoming books when they, when they come. Um, Thanks on so behalf of, yeah. <laughs> it. You guys are great and you're such a great bookstore and everybody should pre-order from them so that they can keep doing what they do. Thank you. We agree with that. And that's so lovely to hear. Um, yeah, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, keep reading and be well out there. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night.